Good morning, uh, everyone, um, and welcome to the third in a series of four uh, webinars we're carrying out, um, describing and talking you through best practices when it comes to uh, designing and sizing and installing renewable energy systems, in particular ground source heat pumps, which we focused on in the last two, and they're on our website, and air source heat pumps, which we're focusing on today. And next week, next Friday, we'll be focusing on solar PV and batteries. Um, my name is Will McCarthy. I'm based in our West office in Tewkesbury, uh, and I'm a consultant for ISO Energy, um, and I have been employed by ISO Energy for a number of years now, and I've been in the renewables industry for about 11 years. Um, so today we'll be talking you through how best to size and design air source heat pumps, how they could be located, the different pitfalls to look out for, and obviously um, all the considerations that need to be made when it comes to working with air source heat pumps in different types of properties. Um, you'll notice in this presentation, there's an opportunity to ask questions via the Q&A tab or the chat tab, which is um, uh, located on the presentation sidebar. Um, we will gather those questions up and we'll answer all of those at the end of the seminar. Um, and so if there's anything pressing until then, um, we will come to it at that point. I'm sure some of those questions may well be answered in the presentation we're about to go through. So without further ado, I'll just talk you through who we are and what we do. I know some of you may have already seen this, but it's important that we just understand why we're in a position to talk about best practice. Um, so we are a team of 60. Um, we've been going for over 14 years now. Uh, we turn over around 8 million pounds a year and we've over a thousand installations to our name. The vast majority of those are heat pumps. Um, we also deal with obviously solar and biomass and, and everything else in between. Um, as I mentioned, I'm in our West office in Tewkesbury and we have a head office in Hawley in Surrey. And from there we provide national coverage. Um, and our aim and, our, uh, and, and the role we play in a project is that we consult, we design, we install and we, we maintain. So from the very start of the conversation, we're providing you with a clear guidance in terms of uh, exactly what system might suit the property best, how it can be delivered, what sort of cost you're looking at, the benefits. And obviously our name, and, and you'll see this from our website, has been made working in quite old leaky listed buildings, but that's by no means our, um, our niche. We also work within you know, new build properties, domestic homes, commercial developments, and what, what, what the role that we play as a consultant is really to give you uh, a huge amount of knowledge and understanding of the, the solution and try to break that down and explain it to you in layman's terms about how it can effectively work within the confines of your building in the area you're looking to heat or the, or the properties you're looking to, to connect to. Um, we can then obviously put that all into writing and into drawings and complete quite complex but ultimately very descriptive and um, uh, informative designs. And those designs will be able to be shared with other trades you might have on site, but essentially they're, they're tailored to your needs and they provide you with all the information from layouts, schematics that you might need for um, you know, instrumentation diagrams, uh, groundworks drawings if it's a ground source heat pump, and obviously uh, drawings surrounding the installation of air source heat pumps as well. So the plinth that may be needed or enabling works, for example, and we can come on to that in this presentation. Um, we then obviously install and we have a number of different teams providing different solutions. So obviously groundworks side of things for ground source heat pumps, but we also have plumbing and electrical teams. And as we talk about in this presentation with air source heat pumps, um, we focus particularly on the quality of the fixtures and the fittings, because we believe that you, you certainly get what you pay for when it comes to renewable systems. Uh, and if you're um, using the best quality products and the best quality fixtures and fittings, then that usually plays its role in, in giving you the best long-term efficiency. And finally, I think this is really important, and you'll see why perhaps when it comes to um, this presentation, is maintaining the system. Um, obviously, having the ability to install it is one thing, but really you should want to be in ensuring that the system you're designing and installing can be easily maintained, it can be easily serviced, and ultimately can last a, a long time, which is um, why you would want to invest in such technology. So why do people choose renewables um one is there's a significant running cost reduction if it's designed correctly obviously uh two is there's improved comfort levels again if it's designed correctly um the main the main one that obviously a word on the, a lot of people's lips at the moment is carbon and the carbon emissions you can expect from a heat pump system will be north of 60 percent uh, versus fossil fuels 
there's a very a very significant amount of future proofing as well to be considered uh, years ago perhaps heat pumps were installed for the reasons above uh, but future proofing is very real, a very real possibility now and um, actually getting ahead of the curve getting ahead of um, what is incoming legislation uh, you will you will, a heat pump will allow you to do that and then finally i think the other thing to think about is this is incentivized i, I do think if you're making the decision based purely on incentives then it might not, not be the might not be the full decision to make but certainly it is an incentivized technology and um they should be taken advantage of and, and the idea behind the consultancy that we provide is that we're we're getting the best value out of all five of those points so understanding clearly what's going to give you the best long-term solution um in terms of improving comfort levels essentially how a heat pump works and this goes right the way from ground source to water source to air source is it uses the thermal mass of the building um, what we're looking to do is keep the building at a constant temperature and just keep topping that up rather than trying to heat it from cold two or three times a day. Um, in terms of that, 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 by doing that, though, it does protect, obviously, what's in the building and, and the contents of that. Um, and then again, another myth when we're, we're touching this more is the idea of hot water. You should, if it's designed correctly, expect plentiful amounts of hot water to be held at a high temperature, which is far too hot to bathe in directly. So, um, hot water is a non-issue and we, we will talk about that uh, as uh, as the as we go on carbon reduction is obviously a really big thing at the moment um, and heating does make up about 18 percent of the uk's carbon footprint so a heat pump is the the next big thing coming off the government decarbonization program um, they've looked at you know generating green electricity through solar and wind this is how we're going to use that green electricity through heat pumps so the combination of the two be it on a national scale um, right the way down to a small individual scale with um, solar PV and a heat pump perhaps working alongside it. Uh, that is how you're going to significantly reduce your building's carbon footprint. Um, and obviously these incentives that are available are there exclusively because of the CO2 reductions. They're, they're encouraging to up, up, uptake because you're having such a significant impact on your own personal CO2 um, you know, emissions so we say whilst also um helping the, the wider country and the, and the and the wider general public reduce the the uk's total figure so part of the heat pumps installation is obviously future proofing that and you're perhaps as if you're looking at building houses or developing properties and you're thinking about doing this in the coming years you're likely to go to, you're likely to be faced with certain regulations and and legislations that you might need to adhere, adhere to um very much the, the idea behind the future proofing though is also to drive down the running cost of the system get away from fossil fuels avoid potential carbon taxes and and really increase the life expectancy of your of your heating system because a, a heat pump if it's designed correctly will have a longer life expectancy than most modern boilers um so without further ado we move on to the subject of the day which is air source heat pumps and as you can see here there are a number of um, different models and types of air source heat pumps you can install and they've all been designed and 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 put together to come up with their own um, solution so on the left hand side on the top left and the bottom right you'll see ctc air source heat pumps which are quite large uh, as you can see they're big units but they they they, they need to be potentially because of the size of the building they're heating um, top right is a standard nevi air source heat pump uh, and that is um and, and, and that is there simply because it's a a fantastic unit in a domestic setting um, so it's a really a, a good bit of kit and we'll talk to you more about that in a, in a minute um, and, and down below on the bottom left is a SEAT unit it's a 400 kilowatt system heating a garden center so I, I think the idea behind presenting these four units is because we can go right the way from the bottom of the market which is the standard sort of domestic system you see in the top right right the way through to a commercial setting in the bottom left and there's a solution that fits all so if ground source isn't an option and air source is, there is a, a method um, that can be found. It's just about understanding carefully how a heat pump can work in the building it's going into. So some of the big things that um, stop people from installing heat pumps is perhaps what they find online or what they think they, they've been told by others. And there's a number of myths that surround heat pumps that need to be 
um, put to bed, I feel. They've been sort of hanging over the industry quite a lot in the last 10 years as the take-up of heat pumps has improved. And slowly but surely, the general public is coming around to a more positive way of thinking about how heat pumps should be working. But actually, a lot of these myths feel perhaps from the uh, fossil fuel industry or from um, people with maybe an agenda associated directly to the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that all of these are perfectly acceptable points to talk about. But actually, again, if the system is designed correctly, none of them are relevant. So if we look, you know, some of these you'll see, you might hear online or, or hear in conversation about keeping you warm, temperature of the hot water, for example, how you need to distribute the heat in the building, if you need planning permission or not, and obviously if you need a backup system. All of these really are myths. Um, and ultimately, we can come up onto these points more as we go through the presentation. But what we're looking to do here is show you clearly why they are myths and how actually through careful consideration, an air source heat pump can be applied in all different settings. Um, so the questions that I think the, the, the reasons why people install heat pumps are, um, are because they, they do bust these myths. You, you shouldn't ha have these hanging over you if you are considering an air source heat pump system. If you are using a competent installer, they should have a, an answer, both in terms of the design of the system and the practicality of it, and also in terms of layman terms of exactly how an air source heat pump will um, bust that myth and make sure that the heat pump works effectively um, through its lifetime. So where heat pumps are particularly effective are obviously in new builds. So if you're building a house, um, if you're putting building a house now and connecting it to a fossil fuel, you really are just kicking the can down the road in terms of cost. So um, whatever you do, uh, don't do that. Um, buildings where there's a peak load under 12 kilowatts. And the reason I say that is all down to sizing of air source heat pumps. Um, and if the building has a, has a peak load under 12 kilowatts, then often the economies of scale are more attractive with a, an air source heat pump installation than they perhaps might be with a ground source heat pump or a water source heat pump installation. Um, another way air source heat pumps are very effective are within developments where there's, they, they require multiple installations and multiple bits of kit. Um, and you can simply just attach a unit to the external wall and, and have an internal tank, say. Uh, and that is a very you know, simple solution, which is equally as effective as a boiler without um, having to have large amounts of drilling or, or trenching as you would do with a ground source heat pump, say. In rental properties, they're also very effective because you might want to get the tent away from using the fossil fuel or reduce the running costs of maybe an Airbnb or something like that. And therefore, if you're putting in a, an air source heat pump system, you're going to take advantage of um, reduce running costs and therefore the value of your rental property increases. Um, the other way to look, look at it is obviously if you're having to meet a, a certain carbon reduction target or there's building regs that require you to put a heat pump in and you, you're working to a budget, therefore an air source heat pump is likely to be the more cost effective option. And then the other thing to think about is if there's an outdoor pool. So we'll show you examples of how a heat pump can be adapted to heat a house in the winter provide domestic hot water throughout the entire year, and then heat an outdoor pool in the summer months during the swimming season. And that way you're getting a, a really getting a 12 month benefit from the heat pump itself. Um, obviously, if you're just doing spatial heating, you will only ever get um, six months out of the heat pump, say, and obviously 12 months out of the domestic hot water. But if you're heating a pool as well, you're working the heat pump throughout the year and the value of that investment obviously significantly improves. Um, and then in, obviously, if we're working in very tight, confined spaces, so in cities, for example, you could look at installing heat pumps on the roof of, a, of an apartment block or within the roof of a property and connecting it down through the building itself. And then another reason why heat pumps are particularly effective is, like I say, to future proof the development, um, to make sure you're ahead of the curve, to, to avoid carbon taxes. So some of the considerations we go to today are going to be the sizing and the location of the outdoor unit, the location of the indoor plant. And you see a plant room on the right hand side there, which is obviously quite a large plant room, but still it's a, a, an air source heat pump plant room. And then the, a really important one is obviously the proximity to the neighbors. So noise, there's a, a bit of a myth surrounding the noise of air source heat pumps. Again, if they're designed correctly and, and, and if you're using a quality manufacturer, then noise really should never be an issue. And it shouldn't be any noisier than the flu of a traditional boiler. But still, let's let's debate that today. Um, and then obviously output of system versus the peak load demands of the building. And this is essential. 
whatever you do, do not think of an air source heat pump as a boiler, both in terms of how it operates, in terms of the level of heat it will give you, but equally how it should be sized. You have to understand that heat pumps will reduce in output in the very depths of winter. It's, it, it, there, there is no heat pump on the market that doesn't do that. And I know that manufacturers may argue differently, but actually from all the testing that we've done as an installer and we do test our units, we can see clearly there is a drop off in output and understanding that that isn't an issue if it's designed correctly is important. A heat pump may well reduce an output in the very depths of winter, but as long as that's acknowledged within the design, the system will still be more than capable of providing all of the heating and hot water the building might need in the, in the, in the depths of winter. And obviously, as with anything, manufacturer choice is essential. I know from our point of view, we certainly like using Scandinavian manufacturers because of their reliability, because of their warranties, because of their performance, because of their control system. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone should use Scandinavian heat pumps, but they are a great option for air source models. Um, we're not tied to them and we always look to review our portfolio, but certainly Scandinavian heat pumps do provide you with a, a fantastic option when it comes to air source heating. Um, and then electrical capacity. So one of the first things that I will look at as a consultant is obviously how much electricity you have feeding a property. If there is a reduced electrical capacity, then we have to understand that the heat pump will have to be balanced within that and obviously allow enough capacity for the rest of the house to operate. Or if there's a particularly large demand or perhaps other items being installed onto that, that supply, such as electric argers, car charging points, even pool heating equipment, that kind of thing, then it may well be worth looking at a slightly increased supply, maybe another single phase or a three phase electrical supply. And by doing that, you will, uh, there will be a, a significant amount of future proofing within the building anyway, because you then have that ability to install more, more solar if you wanted to, more car charging points, whatever it may be. Um, potential enabling works. So certainly if there's a new build site or if there's a, um, a renovation project, for example, there will be need to be work done by others to get the site ready for us to install an air source heat pump. And we can come to that in terms of what that will need to be. Um, then how you can get the most out of your heat pump, perhaps how you can combine different technologies to work effectively with a heat pump. What is going to be worth going, you know, what are the, 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 the technologies that are worth perhaps installing alongside a heat pump and what's not worth doing? Uh, where will money be wasted if you were to, to go down that route? The other thing to think about, and, and this is noted here, is insulation. So obviously older buildings do have a higher peak load. We're used to working in old buildings and we can design air source heat pumps to work effectively within very old leaky listed buildings. But if there is an opportunity to, to insulate a building, it should always be taken um, because the cheapest form of heat is the one you're not you're paying for that's going up into the sky somewhere. Um, so putting in a bit of insulation in the walls and the floors and the roof, whatever you may be, if you're doing um, renovation works, do, do take advantage of that because it will pay, it will pay um, it for itself many times over in the life expectancy of a, an air source heat pump system. So the first point we're going to cover is obviously the siting and the location of the air source system. So one thing to think about is how far the system might be from a plant room. You can obviously put an air source heat pump away from the building if you wish and move it um, down the end of the garden or around behind the back of the garage or behind the bins or whatever it may be. Um, but you do need to think about how you connect that heat pump back to the property. There are different types of heat pumps and they connect back to a building in, in, in different ways. The most common option would be a monoblock system. And therefore what you want to do is preserve the heat that the system creates within the external unit. So we would install an insulated pipe buried within a trench, which would, be part, would consist of part of maybe the enabling works done by others. And that, that would then preserve the heat that the air, air source heat pump is creating, ready for it to be stored within our buffer tank and our hot water tanks. Um, so that can all be done, but there is a cost obviously for that insulated pipe. It could be 40 to 70 pounds a meter, depending on how far away and how big the pipe needs to be, the heat pump is from the building. Um, Another thing to think about is proximity to neighbours. So you do have to complete a noise assessment and we're, we're touching this in a minute, um, but we have to understand uh, how close the unit might be to the neighbours, but in particularly living rooms, bedrooms, that kind of thing. Um, they're you know, planning officers, um, noise assessments, MCS as an accreditation body, they will want that signed off by the accredited installer. Um, so there's no point sort of squeezing that through or, or trying to you know, turn a blind eye to that. It has to be acknowledged. 
And then it, the other thing to think about is, is there adequate space in front and behind the unit? So what you don't want to do, for example, is box in the unit with, I don't know, um, fencing or a, a, a brick wall or something like that, where you're going to really restrict the amount of airflow that's coming in behind the unit because the, the heat pump will draw in the air behind the unit. And what you certainly don't want to do is build something directly in front of the unit because as it removes the heat from the air, it will blow that cool air out of the front of the unit. Uh, and if it hits up, it immediately is blown straight into a wall, it will simply rise up and be drawn into the back of the unit again. And there, you've, therefore, you may have this issue of this recirculating, this cold air, which constantly drives down the temperature of the, the air that we're trying to take heat from, and therefore the efficiency of the heat pump suffers. So that diagram on the right-hand side is uh, using a NIBI system, for example, uh, but it shows the spatial requirements that the warranty of the NIBI unit requires and also is best practice in terms of an installation of a system. And then a soak away is also needed to be considered um, during cold snaps around sort of plus two to minus two in particular, there may be a number of defrost cycles that the heat pump has to go to. Again, it's about how we size that and work around that with the, the needs of the building. But if there is a defrost cycle, then there's likely to be con condensation and there's likely to be liquid that comes away from the, the, the unit itself. So maybe putting a gravel surround or, 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 or a condensate pipe, which is directing that liquid towards a drain somewhere, is going to be worthwhile because you don't want to slip on that or have a, a pathway which becomes um, you know, unusable. Power to the heat pump location. So you will have power requirements internally and the power requirement externally. So you'll need to run... Uh, electric cabling to the heat pump unit obviously if it's on the side of a building that's fairly easy to do if it is away from the building as we talked about earlier then we will need to run ducting within that trench to allow us to install an adequate cable um, and then that also then forms part of that enabling work so if there needs to be a, tren uh, a trench produced or if there needs to be a concrete plinth produced your installer will be, should be able to provide you with all of that detail so the plinth dimensions how big the heat pump is within that that, that plinth itself um, and obviously what sort of size the plinth might need to be for the system to work effectively. And then the idea, another thing to think about is obviously the location of the indoor plant. So here you see a couple of examples. One is a, 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 an old Hitachi unit we used to install, um, and that, show, as, as you can see, the internal unit looks like a fridge freezer. So fitting into a, a utility room or even an understairs cupboard is doable. Um, but there are limitations to what's available within that that, that freezer unit, so to speak. Um, you, you won't perhaps have a m as much hot water as you would do if you were using the uh, same plant room, the, the plant room system, which is shown on the bottom right. As you can see in the image on the bottom right, we have a buffer tank on the left and a hot water tank on the right. So we've got two tanks servicing the heating and hot water needs of the buildings entirely. So certainly if there's a, a relatively large occupancy or if there's a, um, a, a, a building which needs um, a large amount of heat or, or, or has maybe a, a pool that needs heating or, or you know, other spaces that we need to think about, then you need to size the tanks accordingly. If you undersize the, t the hot water tank or you undersize the heating tank, you're just going to run out of heating, you're going to run out of hot water if you're not careful. Or, particularly in, in relevance to the buffer tank, the system will work inefficiently. Um, so... The other option to think about, and this is a genuinely really important thing, is, is how much space you have to, to look after the equipment. You, you do want to allow um, uh, engineers to be able to look after that equipment long term. So in our standardized designs that we produce for air source heat pumps, we will show you the access requirements for the units itself alongside the spatial requirements of the external unit. Um, Equipment choice is obviously quite important as well, making sure that um, the coil inside the hot water tank is sized suitably for the needs of the building, making sure the buffer tank is suitably sized just in line with manufacturer requirements. All of that thing becomes comes into consideration when you're putting into a, a heat pump system. And then how we run our systems is quite important. So we want to be able to install a north facing sensor and that's so we run the heat pump using a, a, a weather compensated setting so the heating element of the heat pump has a variable temperature depending on how warm or cold the outside the outside temperature is and that's dictated by the north facing sensor what you don't want to do is run the heat pump at a fixed temperature because you then result it, you have a very inefficient system which is running far too high for the needs of the building most of the year so by having a system which is uh, running at a variable temperature, which can be adjusted by you, I might add, as the end user, 
but allowing that system to modulate its output depending on um, or, or modulate its temperature depending on how warm or cold it is outside will maximize the efficiency of the system. So we need to get a north facing sensor somewhere uh, into the plant room or onto a wall somewhere. And obviously that can be, um, you can you know, find a, a suitable place to put that perhaps behind a drain pipe or similar, which is going to be uh, within easy reach, but equally you need to make sure that sensor is working effectively. And then again, as with the outdoor unit, potential enabling work. So in the image on the bottom right, you'll see that our client has very kindly applied the, the wall of the, the plant room ready for our arrival. It makes for a very neat installation in terms of nice straight lines, in terms of insulated pipe work looking nice and neat. And obviously from an installer's point of view, it's an easy installation. The floor is ready, the, the walls are ready. We can get on and do the job we need to do. Um, so then in terms of proximity to neighbors, um, it's obviously a question which is always on everyone's lips. How noisy are these things? Are they going to be sound like an industrial estate? Are they going to be, um, you know, am I going to hear it from the end of the garden or, or am I going to hear it in bed? Um, and it's a, you know, a good question to ask. And, and it comes up every single time we talk about an aerosol heat pump system. Manufacturers, not just Swedish manufacturers, but manufacturers um, of air source heat pumps have come a long way in terms of the noise of their systems because this is, they know this is a, a common question. So you'll find that the decibel rating of heat pumps is very, very low in comparison to perhaps it want, what it once was. Um, and certainly in comparison to commercial um, air to air handling units or, or similar that you sometimes see on the side of industrial states. Um, so domestic air source heat pumps do come with a very low um, noise output but it still needs to be considered so um, as part of a uh, an accredited installer as part of the design works they will need to do a noise assessment and us as a consultant we do that at the very start because we want sign off in our head that the system is going to be all accredited so we don't want to waste anyone's time if it isn't um, but that means then we can make sure that the system meets all noise accredited requirements. So as you can see, we're taking into account things like a potential barrier noise reduction, again, being mindful that we don't want to prevent the heat pump from doing its job by blocking the heat pump and, and putting something directly in front of it. Um, and we're also taking into account things like sound directivity. So obviously if there's a, a wall behind the heat pump or there's two walls either side of it, we need to understand that that will increase the, uh, the, 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 the noise that one might hear from the unit itself. Um, Ultimately, if you're using a credit installer and they're installing the heat pump, you can, if you haven't seen the noise assessment, you can assume that the noise assessment has been passed. They might not have um, communicated that with you, but it's worth getting eyes on that anyway, so you can be comfortable with it all. Ultimately, though, when you look at the decibel rating of a, of a heat pump, really it's in line with a, the flu of a traditional boiler. So I think it's just perhaps as these, as these units become much more mainstream, people will become a lot more au fait with them. They will understand that they're not that noisy if they are designed correctly. They may see a fan turning, but the noise is simply a very low hum of a fan, like a, a almost like a fridge-like noise if you're stood certainly around the corner from the unit or, 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 five, or, or five to 10 meters away. If you're stood directly in front of the unit, you will obviously hear a fan, you will hear that noise. But um, the idea would be that you can install an air source heat pump system in most settings if it qualifies um, for that uh, passes that noise assessment. There are ways you can reduce the noise. So there are things like acoustic boxes and, and the like that you can put around the heat pump. But again, as a company that holds efficiency and performance above everything else, it's really important to ensure that that noise reduction box, the acoustic box doesn't limit the heat pump's ability to provide you with heat and obviously limit the heat pump's efficiency. Um, so it's about finding that sweet spot. Obviously, if you wanted to apply a noise reduction box, you have every right to do so, but just bear that in mind. What you don't want to do is to, to freeze a system or to prevent it from doing its job. And, th and that leads us on to the output of a system versus the peak load demands of the building. Um, and this may well be the most important part of all heat pump conversations that you have you know, today and going forward. And that's because a heat pump is not a boiler. Do not size it like you would size a boiler. So if you have a 10 kilowatt, um, you understand that the building needs 10 kilowatts of, of a peak load and, the, and, and it has a, a 10 kilowatt peak load that needs to be satisfied. Do not put in a 10 kilowatt air source heat pump because and in the very depths of winter, you will find that the heat pump will not be capable of delivering you that 10 kilowatts of peak load, which is your peak load, i.e. the house heating requirement in the very depths of winter. 
So how a heat pump is size is essential to it, the success of the installation and its long-term performance. If you have a heat pump which is undersized, you will fall into that category of reaffirming those myths. So you will have a system which doesn't get your water hot enough, it doesn't get your house hot enough, it costs a lot to run, it constantly breaks down because it doesn't, it is, is overworked, and actually you have to wear three jumpers when, it, when the temperature drops below plus four because the system is just failing. So really, really, really um, put a lot of pressure on your uh, installer to confirm exactly how they size the unit. They should know how the heat pump performs in the very depths of winter because a lot of manufacturers out there provide a output figure um, which is determined upon a flow temperature of 35 degrees, which is very low and, and really is only a flow temperature you could achieve in a very new builds or in underfloor circuits, for example. Um, and they base it upon maybe an outside temperature of seven degrees outside, so plus seven, which is above the average UK winter heating temperature. What you want to do is cut through all of that and look at how the heat pump performs at minus seven. How does it stand up when there's six inches of snow on the ground and there's you know, um, a cold biting wind? And if the answer is that it can't match the peak load of the building, which is essentially the basis of that, that calculation, the basis of the, the system sizing, then you need to look at a bigger unit or you need to look at alternatives. Um, so that is really important. And I think the biggest hangover that perhaps people have within this industry from, from, from past, and, and, and I must admit installers are getting better and better and better, and systems and quality of installations are getting better. But certainly when people were, were sort of, taking um, looking to, to, to adapt air source heat pumps early um, on in the process there wasn't enough thought about how they are sized um, so sizing also then ties into the reliance on an immersion so if you are installing a heat pump with perhaps a separate hot water tank and a separate buffer tank then you have the opportunity to install immersions within those tanks and those immersions should be controlled by the heat pump to only ever come on once every couple of weeks to prevent Legionella, to complete the Legionella, for cycle, um, Legionella cycle for the domestic hot water, or in case of emergency, if the heat pump goes into fail, failure or alarm mode. Um, those immersions are there as an, top, uh, as an emergency backup to the system and should not be used as a top up. So it's all very well saying, oh, the heat pump will heat you right the way down to the middle of winter. Um, but make sure that, that that means that the heat pump will do that, not the heat pump with an immersion providing a top up to that. Um, the idea behind an immersion in a hot water tank is that it's not there necessary. It will increase the temperature of the water. So you could ultimately rely on, on it in periods of very high occupancy. But I think the more important way to look at it is it increases the, the capacity because there's less dilution. So you will use, um, say, 50 litres of hot water in a bath normally. If you're, heat, if you're using the immersion to bring that hot water up to 65 degrees, then obviously you'll use less of that. But I think the important thing to understand is that the domestic hot water temperature using an air source heat pump should be held at between 50 to 52, 53 degrees, which is too hot to bathe in. Um, if you go to a hotel or a hospital, the water is usually limited to around 40 degrees. So if you're happy with that comfort level, then 55 degrees is going to be far too hot. So you then have to add cold water to have a comfortable bath or shower. The role of that immersion is to bring that temperature to beyond 65 degrees once every couple of weeks. Or if you really want to, in terms of high occupancy, you could manually boost the temperature of the water using the immersion. And, but that should not be relied on on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis. The role of the buffer tank is also quite important. It obviously allows us to um, prevent the system from short cycling, which is really important in times of perhaps low output use or um, uh, you know, when there's a limited occupancy within the building. Um, and, but equally, it, it does play a role when the system is maybe recharging the hot water tank or there's, it, the, the air source heat pump is going for a defrost cycle, for example. The role of the buffer tank will allow the continuation of, of heat to flow through the building. Um, Output versus efficiency is also important. So how well the heat pump performs in the depths of winter is one thing, but does it do so efficiently? And if the, 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 the reason we like using um, Swedish manufacturers, I think, and we, we will talk about this in a minute, is because they have a combination of relatively high output in the depths of winter and relatively high efficiency. So the combination of the two provides a good option across all, all, all um, consideration points. Um, and, and, and then in, in just in total, 
get a detailed heat loss calculation for the building. So without a detailed heat loss calculation, you are essentially estimating what the building needs. So take take some time, spend some money on uh, a, an installer, which will provide you with that, um, that level of consultation, that ability to provide that heat loss calculation, get that in place. And then that's the basis of all calculations going forward. When you know that the room by room heat loss calculations have been completed, there's been some uh, roundup factor applied to it to account for any minor human error mistakes or, or issue, you know, software, you know, you know, standardized software templates that might be used then at least you know you're assuming absolute worst case in terms of the building's need and that any heat pump that's sized off the back of that will be sized correctly and appropriately for the requirements of the space. So in terms of manufacturer, um, there's obviously lots of different air source heat pump manufacturers out there and they all have pros and cons. Um, I think what we're the reason we like to use Scandinavian manufacturers is essentially to, 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 to use and, and to take advantage of the, the high level of customer support that they provide us as a manufacturer to an installer, that's really quite important because on occasion parts go wrong, things need to be replaced, warranties need to be um, taken advantage of. And to have a manufacturer which is willing to pick up the phone to take it to help you do that is, is, is vital. Um, the other thing to think about is obviously performance. And we just touched upon that in terms of output and efficiency. So holding a high output, holding a high efficiency and operating efficiently in the depths of winter. Um, warranty, so the standard warranty for a, a heat pump really should be around seven years, and that's likely to be two years parts and, uh, and labor and um, for the further five years for the parts. Um, so that's quite important. And the two manufacturers which we tend to use more of in NEBI and CTC, although EcoForest, who we traditionally use for our ground source heat pumps, have also just released an air source system as well. Manufacturers are adapting perhaps how they develop air source heat pumps. So one thing I haven't touched upon in this slide, but is more of a technical discussion and really delving into the depths and the operation of, a, of an air source heat pump is, is the type of refrigerant that you might use. There is a, a change to the R290 refrigerant, which allows the flow temperature of a system to be, to be slightly higher than it would otherwise be traditionally with um, previous um, forms of refrigerant. So therefore the ability to heat buildings using maybe a higher flow temperature around the central heating system without taking away anything from the efficiency of the system um, is, is quite impressive. So that will start to become more and more mainstream as this technology ramps up in terms of its output. Um, the controller is also another consideration. It's all very well having a nice heat pump, but if you don't know how to control it and, and manipulate it and use it to your advantage if needs be, then um, it, it's, it's no use to anyone. So the controller is vital and it's also important you have adequate training from the installer or from the consultant on how to use that controller. Um, both CTC and Nevi and EcoForest, to their credit, have a controller which is easy to access. It can be remotely accessed as well. So the, manu the, the manufacturer, but equally the installer can provide that remote support. Um, the error codes can be easily understood and easily rectified. Um, and actually, from your point of view, you can clearly see what's going on. So what temperature the system is delivering in terms of heating, buffer tank, hot water. You know, if you want to boost the hot water temperature, here's the option to do that. It, it's all very straightforward. Um, and, and then equipment choice. So if you notice on previous slides, we've shown you different examples of plant rooms and, and different units that could be used internally. So if you are using a manufacturer, do they then insist that you use the tanks that they install? And if so, what are the, the costs of that? How, how efficient are they? Are they going to be come with an insulated jacket or are they, are they going to be um, uh, breaking down every six months? Or you know, what, what are the options there? I think the best way we can look at it is that we try and use a, a certain manufacturers for certain items. We know how our tank manufacturers perform. We know how our heat pump manufacturers perform. We know how our pump manufacturers perform. And if we can combine the, 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 these different manufacturers together to provide an efficient total solution, that is often the better option than perhaps having to install something because the manufacturer insists that you have to use their equipment. Um, so the, the next slide and um, drawing to a, a close, but essentially the, the, what we're looking at here is how to um, understand whether you need uh, an additional electrical capacity or um, understand potential enabling works as well. So if you have access to three phase or there's an opportunity to install a three phase supply 
uh, electrical incoming electrical supply for relatively low cost, then I would certainly take advantage of that. And I would take advantage of that regardless of whether you are going to install an air source heat pump or not. And that's because it will allow you the ability to install more electrical items within your property, electric Argus, for example, car charging points. You could install a relatively large solar PV array if you wanted to, which in, in turn then complements car charging, complements the electrification of, of heat or, 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 or um, the Argo in the, in the property, whatever. Um, and then obviously in terms of uh, understanding your electrical capacity, a competent consultant or design engineer or installer should be able to go into your property, understand what you have or have a very clear picture of what you should be able to have, and therefore, then, if you need more, they can take the steps to, uh, to help you get more electricity. So if you need to upgrade to a, uh, another single phase supply or a three phase supply, then they can, they can talk you through that and walk you through that process and make sure that that, that, um, that can happen. Or they can design a system to work within the confines of a building. So just because you might have a single phase supply doesn't mean you can't have an electric arga or a car charging point, solar panels and a heat pump if you wanted to. But it does mean that we just need to carefully balance all of those items within the supply that you've got. And again, a competent engineer will be able to then go away, work potentially with the district network operators. So you know, Western Power or SSE or whoever it may be, and come up with a solution which works within the confines of the, the supply without the lights going off when the temperature drops below plus three. Um, in terms of plant room preparation, there may need to be some legwork done ahead of inst uh, an installation. So certainly we, we would like to have a plywood finish on the wall or we like to have a breeze block finish on the wall to make an installation nice and neat. Um, I think because air source heat pumps essentially can be turned around in terms of installation time relatively quickly, um, often to, to, to ask the installer to put the plinth in allow the plinth to set to then install the system on top of it it can can really sort of drag out a job so if there's an opportunity for the plinth to be created ahead of arrival that should be taken and actually it's a it's, it's worth doing in terms of allowing the installer then to get on and just install the heat bump and do what they do best um, so again a good installer should be able to provide you with all the detail of this enabling works yeah, you know, where a wall might need to be applied, where an entry might need to be um, come through, you know, where we might need to come through the wall, where we will perhaps um, terminate on our tanks or on valves or wherever that may be. Um, so all of that enabling work should be detailed and described to you way before the installation takes place. So firstly, you can have an understanding of what needs to be done. And secondly, you can put a cost to that. Um, you know, if you're having to dig huge trenches and and, and put down concrete plinths and, and dig holes in floors to bring insulated pipe up through. You, you need to be aware of that as the client as to, to, to what, what enabling works might be needed. Um, in terms of how you can get the most out of your heat pump, uh, there's various different ways to do that. But essentially, if you imagine you've electrified your heating system. So therefore, if you install solar PV, you will, will have that, that complement of technologies working together. I will suggest, though, that um, solar PV is obviously very effective in the height of summer when a heat pump is using less electricity and ultimately an air source heat pump, importantly, is working most efficiently because the external air temperature is so high. So therefore, solar, although it's um, uh, going to complement a heat pump, it shouldn't be seen as vital. You shouldn't need to think that you have to have solar panels to have a heat pump. Um, an air source heat pump will still be very, very effective in terms of driving down the running costs of your building. And, and reducing your carbon footprint without solar alongside that. But if you have the opportunity to put solar in, it will complement that and it will help reduce the running costs. So then you could also install something known as Solar iBoost or Immersion. Um, and those units are essentially connected to your solar PV array, but they feed excess electricity produced by the PV panels in the summer directly into the immersion of your hot water tank within the heat pump. So therefore your heat immersion is then providing you with free hot water. So rather than installing solar PV panels and solar thermal panels, so one to create electricity and then one to create hot water, you essentially just add a solar eye boost or a immersion unit to the immersion and to the PV array, so the immersion within the hot water tank, and that will then charge your hot water temperature using the free electricity that's being produced from the solar PV panels. So again, you're getting the most out of your, your heat pump system, your, your conversion, your, your, your electrification of, of heating and, and, your, and your solar PV array. A battery as well will obviously help complement the heat pump. So the ability to be able to store electrical energy and perhaps use that within the heat pump at a later stage. 
Um, and that ties in quite nicely with um, there's agile tariffs that are available with providers such as Octopus Energy, for example, whereby you, there's, there, there's potentially for technology to take advantage of lower cost um, tariffs and use that in terms of running heat pumps or running batteries. And that's something which will become more and more uh, prevalent as the rollout of these technologies becomes much more mainstream. So do keep an eye on that. Car charging, obviously, that plays its role again in terms of getting the most, it doesn't necessarily get the most out of the heat pump, but it certainly gets the most out of a, a solar PV array and a battery installation. And then I think the big one as well is if you have an outdoor pool, if you're lucky enough or um, unlucky enough, depending on how you, how you look at it, to have an outdoor pool, um, one thing that you might be going to in terms of uh, you know, rolling your eyes as we walk, run into summer is how much that pool might cost to heat. So if you have an outdoor pool and you can see the examples in the, in the photos here, and you want to install a heat pump, then actually it's, it's worth carefully looking at an air source heat pump as well as a ground source heat pump, because obviously pool water heating in some buildings, for example, the building in the top left there, the cost of heating that pool in terms of the energy requirement was greater than the cost of providing spatial heating into the house. So therefore, an air source heat pump is a fantastic solution for the building, because not only can it provide heating and hot water to the house, heating in the, in the depths of winter hot water year round, but it can then be adapted to provide the pool water heating in the height of summer. And if, the, if we understand the site, as we have done here, the pool requires more energy than the house, essentially. Therefore, an air source heat pump operating during the swimming season, say April to October, where the air temperature is higher than the ground temperature, is the best option for that building because you have an air source heat pump which is heating the house is capable of heating the house in the depths of winter again holding efficiency even though the outdoor temperature is dropping and then in the summer when the high energy requirements of the pool kick in it's able to operate extremely efficiently because the outdoor air temperature is much higher um, therefore you have a system which is operating 12 months of the year so the value that the client gets in terms of their investment is significant and because it still it is still providing spatial heating, it still qualifies for the domestic RHI. So they still you still receive a R, an RHI payment for this system, a renewable heat incentive payment over uh, an annual payment over the next seven years. But you're using the system for twelve months of the year by just simply adapting and and improvising the plant room fit out to switch between the two as the temperature and the seasons change. So. What I wanted to do as we come to a, a summary is just show you some examples of this technology. And I really, really wanted to show you how it can be adapted into old buildings. Again, there's a myth that buildings won't be, old buildings can't be heated with a heat, an air source heat pump or a ground source heat pump for that matter. It is a myth. And as you can see here, the proof is in the pudding. These are systems that we've installed, which are working, which are costing as little as possible to run because the design of the air source heat pump has been implemented correctly. Now, as you can see, these buildings are old, so it's important to understand that they will, they will have a higher heat demand than the building in the middle, for example, which is obviously a brand new conversion next to a lake. And I can explain why we haven't used the lake there in a minute. Um, but these old buildings will all have a heat demand which, has to be, which can be met if the system is designed correctly. So as long as you understand what the heat demand is of a building, and as long as you understand how capable the emitters, so the radiators of the underfloor circuit within each building can be, then you can design a system that can comfortably heat the property throughout the year. The, you, a lot of these properties have just a traditional radiator circuit. Now that doesn't mean you have to have ginormous radiators or radiators which are completely oversized and take over the room, but it does mean that you have to ensure that the system has the ability to get the heat into the room. So a double panel radiator where a single panel radiator once was, or if you're making an achievement change to a room, perhaps just increasing the size of the radiator ever so slightly, will go a long way in terms of reducing the running cost of the system and driving the, the, the running cost, the, uh, the, the efficiency of the system right up. But most of our clients um, don't make wholesale changes to the radiators. Some are obviously undergoing significant works internally, and that's a brilliant moment to take advantage of the ability to roll out a new central heating system but a lot of our clients don't want to make massive internal changes so then any minor improvements that can be made to insulation potentially and the uh, the uh, quality heat loss calculation which also then includes a heat emitter assessment to identify 
perhaps how effective the radiators are in the rooms they're in, and if there are under radi and any rooms that have undersized radiators, to highlight those to a client is vital. What the first question that I tend to ask a client when I go to a house and they're looking at an, an air source or a ground source heat pump system and they don't want to make huge changes internally is how effective is the current heating system? I.e., when you turn your boiler on, does the house get to temperature? And if the answer is yes, then the likelihood is that the heat pump will be able to fit into that heating system without huge changes if it is designed correctly. And because and the method of the heating is obviously different, it runs at lower flow temperatures, but it runs for much longer periods of time. So we're using the thermal mass of these structures to bring the house to temperature and just keep topping it up. Um, if they have a particular room, and often that you walk around the house and they say, oh, this room is always a little bit chilly. And you can see quite clearly that the reason for that is because the radiator is undersized. So at that point, the conversation is, well, this is an undersized radiator. It's undersized regardless of whether you're using oil or a heat pump. So therefore, my suggestion would be to either A, live with this system and understand that the heat pump is never going to improve your comfort in this room with that radiator, or B, make the necessary changes, ensure that the system is, is um, uh, adequately sized in this room, the distribution system, and therefore your comfort levels will improve, the efficiency of the system will improve, and the running cost of the system will remain as low as they possibly can be. Um, obviously, if clients are doing wholesale changes, brilliant, take advantage of it, install radiators which are appropriately sized for the rooms they're going into, and all that will happen is the, 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 the flow temperature that's going around that radiator circuit will reduce and reduce and reduce, and the efficiency of the system will increase, and the house will still remain warm and comfortable. So just touching on the house in the middle, as you can see, it's built on a lake. So previous, po uh, previous webinars, we perhaps talked about how we can heat buildings with water. And the only reason we didn't do it with that building, as you can see, it's not a very big structure. So therefore, a small air source heat pump system is actually going to provide better value for them um, long term than a, a relatively large um, water source system, which obviously comes with a lot of material and infrastructure changes which need to be um, put into that building and, and, and to take advantage of that. Um, so to summarize, and we're coming to an end of the presentation, but to summarize, I think the, the, the thing to take away from this is that a well-designed air source heat pump system can work in any building. So if you're currently sat in an old leaky lifted building with limited insulation standards and the wind was howling through the, the windows a, a couple of nights ago, keeping you awake, we can design an air source heat pump to work in that building, but you have to also understand that the heat pump will be bigger it will require potentially a three-phase supply because the size of your building and the insulation in your standards, uh, insulation standards of the building dictate the size of the heat pump system. And obviously we'll need to look carefully at how we distribute heat into that building. But if you're making these changes, then you will have a huge, there will be a huge amount of future proofing linked to those, to the heat pump installation. You shouldn't expect the system to be noisy, but you should inspect, uh, expect the installer to complete a noise assessment. So if it, the system has had a noise assessment completed on it and it's passed that, it meets accreditation standards and therefore you shouldn't expect the system to be noisy, but it has to be carefully thought about. Size the system correctly, so understand how capable the heat pump is in the very depths of winter and link that directly to the requirements of the building. It isn't a one size fits all and it shouldn't be treated like a boiler. Um, whatever you do, don't un undersize a heat pump because you will pay for that many, many times over, just as you would do if you undersized Put how much pipe work you put into the ground or into the water if you're doing a ground or water source heat pump. So consider all the spatial requirements, both inside and out. Obviously, look around at where you can put the unit. If it needs to go away from the building, just bear in mind you're going to need to connect that back somehow in a trench, um, and there's going to be a bit of excavation required there. Internally, if you have you know four, five, six bedrooms and you know, a, a young family full of you know, three or four kids, then you might need um, quite a bit of space for your hot water tank. Your buffer tank might need to be a reasonable size to be able to adequately um, provide all the heating hot water that you need into the building. Choose the manufacturer wisely. So you do get what you pay for. If you're getting uh, a number of quotes which seem remarkably good value at very low cost using perhaps manufacturers who, who might well have um, names that you recognize, that might not necessarily be um, the best value long term for you. So it might be the cheapest option, but it certainly might not be the best value for you long term. So really do think carefully about that. The, the, the Swedish manufacturers that we refer to have been around a long time and they are heat pump specialists. They've been in this game a lot longer than perhaps some of the um, better known uh, names that you might hear. 
which uh, may be associated with other technologies not directly linked to heating. Um, insulate your house regardless of the heat source. So if you are pulling up a floor, if you're um, you know, going up into the, bordering out the attic, or if you're um, looking at reducing heat losses regardless of um, uh, reducing running costs regardless of uh, whether you're going to put a heat pump or not in insulate because it will help reduce the, the carbon emissions of your building it will help reduce the, the heat loss of your building so it will help which in turn will help reduce carbon emissions um, and then future proof you know, if you are going to install a heat pump now is a perfect time to do it you're you're ahead of the curve you're taking advantage of incentive schemes which are available for the next year or so until march 2022 um, you'll reduce your running costs, so there's no good time. There's no better time to do that than now. And ultimately, you will decarbonize the, 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 you know, your heating, so you'll significantly reduce the carbon footprint of you and your property. And that is by installing a heat pump. It is one of the biggest things you can do in terms of reducing carbon um, outside of perhaps giving up meat or, 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 or significantly changing your lifestyle. Um, so that concludes our presentation today. There's obviously lots of different things to consider. And for anyone who has detailed technical questions, perhaps we can pick that up away from the webinar. There have been a number of questions come in. So if you don't mind, I'll now just work through um, those um, now and, and we can answer those. Some of those may well have been answered in the presentation. So Alison says, I have a heat pump installed in my home since 2013, Alison. Well done you, you're well ahead of the curve. Um, and um, I hope it's working well for you. Um, in, in terms of its main disadvantage is low water temperature. Are more recent systems better in providing hot water? Yes, is the short answer. You shouldn't expect, you shouldn't compromise on comfort just because you're installing a heat pump. Uh, the heat pump system will provide you with enough hot water and enough heating uh, energy if it's designed correctly. So if you are suffering with low hot water temperature, that may be an undersizing issue, i.e. the heat pump is having to keep going, keep going, keep going to, to, keep, to keep the house to temperature and therefore the hot water suffers. Or it may be a case that um, your, your settings might need to be improved in some way or the tank isn't necessarily big enough for the needs of the building. So therefore you're um, not getting enough hot water through the taps to run a bath, to run a shower adequately. And, and the, obviously the dilution factor is driving down the temperature of the water that you feel coming out of your taps. So that should be investigated, Alison. It, it may be a case that you could just change the outdoor unit. I know there's a cost associated with that, um, but certainly you could change the outdoor unit. You may well then be able to take advantage of the RHI depending on what else needs to be changed, um, which is the incentive scheme that's available. Um, but then by changing that uh, unit, you may find that a, a better size unit will improve that hot water temperature. Alistair says, why is the, the plinth a lot bigger than the unit? Uh, essentially, that, that's just to ensure that it can be adequately mounted. Um, it ensures that you can uh, allow for um, uh, adequate um, connections behind that. And it makes our installer's life a lot easier from an installation perspective. Um, in terms of the, the plinth requirements, there are sometimes certain manufacturing requirements that we have to work to as well. And that may well be factored into the design that we've shared with you previously. Um, what does the north facing sensor look like? Do you have an image of one? Yes, they, they do change. So depend, the man, different manufacturers have different um, north facing sensors. I would suggest they look like the size of a small matchbox. Um, and uh, Nevi, for example, has a white one. Um, some of them are uh, uh, you know, dark green or, or black in color. It will be no bigger than um, yeah, a small matchbox on the side of your house. It could fit underneath the gutter line. It could fit um, behind a drain pipe. It could fit you know, somewhere out of sight, um, but it, it is quite important to have one to dictate then the efficiency of the system. Um, the only thing you wouldn't want to do is probably paint over it uh, because that will then potentially block the sensors, which in turn will obviously affect how the system performs. In respect of planning, so Elliot asks, in respect of planning, we have, have had problems when putting more than one in the curtilage of properties, one up and up and down flats. We needed acoustic te tests and this caused several issues. Any suggestions, please? Well, um, if you're installing more than one unit, you are likely to be exceeding permitted development rights. So therefore, you almost certainly will need to go down planning. Acoustic tests can all be done and a good installer should be able to help you um, to, to manage that. There are ways, again, you can reduce the noise of a system by putting in maybe a, um, acoustic surrounds or, or noise dampening equipment around it. Again, you don't want to affect its performance. Um, but more importantly, if, a client, if a, an installer does the noise assessment, 
that there's that's linked directly to the accreditation of the heat pump and that should go a long way in terms of um, answering any co uh, questions or concerns that planning consultants or officers may have in regards to that or even neighbors for example um, so I, I i would suggest that there's um, a, a solution to your problem elliot without getting too de detailed into that but there's a number of things that need to be considered there and once all is considered, I, I, you should be able to install an air source heat pump system. Um, so MJ Lunt says, how do you measure estimate peak demand through detailed heat loss calculations? Um, so we're, we will have to measure each room individually, the size of the windows, the size of the doors, the insulation standards in there. So if obviously if that's, if it's a new build, for example, that's very easy to do using CAD drawings and perhaps U values provided by the architect. Um, but if it's a existing building, we will spend some time on site measuring the property. We would obviously apply a human error factor to that as well. What we don't want to do is just round down the number because it, it makes for a, a cheaper installation or it makes for a, a slightly easier system to install. We want to assume absolute worst case there. And by assuming worst case, we know that the building needs, you know, say, 10 kilowatts and therefore a 16 kilowatt heat pump will be needed because as we've talked about the output of the unit will reduce in the height in the depths of winter and we still need to cover that high peak load of 10 kilowatts even though the outside temperature may well be minus four minus five outside so martin says an issue in the uk is relative humidity which can cause problems in the mornings while the heat pump is prioritizing hot water and defrosting should this be taken into account for the size of the buffer Yes, Martin, in short, it should be. And again, humidity plays its part in terms of defrosting, as you've talked about there, and that's why the role of the buffer is so vital. Again, in terms of prioritizing hot water, it also plays its part. Um, again, defrosting, sizing, understanding the defrost cycle, how many times an hour a system might defrost is really important. So you, you are your, your, your question is, um, the, the simple answer is, Yes, the buffer tank plays a vital role in preventing all the issues that might be associated with the humidity around certain temperature points in the UK, which is normally off the top of my head about what plus two to minus two, I think, or plus two to freezing. So please estimate design and installation costs for a typical domestic four bedroom house and savings per year compared with a gas boiler. So I would suggest um, that uh, you should be looking at a cost depending on who you're using and the type of manufacturer you're using of between 13 to 16,000 pounds all in. That's the total installed cost. Um, and that will save you, I would suggest versus gas, a well-designed uh, source heat pump with a relatively competitive price per electricity because obviously you don't you need to you want to make sure your the cost of your electricity is uh, the unit cost of your electricity is as low as it can be um, you should be looking at a saving of about 10 to 15 percent it isn't vast and it's nowhere near as impressive as the saving you'll make with a fossil fuel boiler such as oil or lpg but there should still be a small saving there bear in mind um, that the gas prices are quite well subsidized at the moment where electricity prices perhaps aren't and that is likely to change as we as, as people are driven towards renewables and the take up of air source heat pump systems. So any questions we're talking about now in terms of running costs? Yes, we have to look at the running cost today, but we also have to have a, a one eye on the future. And as, boy, as, as heat pumps are going to be implemented more and more, and currently the industry is installing about 60 to 70,000 heat pumps a year. Boris wants us to install about 600,000 a year by 2028. And there is currently a carrot in place in the form of incentive scheme. Um, um, so to get up to 600,000 year uh, uh, installs a year, there's likely to be a pretty big stick coming. Um, so all of that is going to be play its part in terms of how we're going to move people off fossil fuels. The other thing to think about, though, the flip side of that coin is obviously fuel poverty. How do we manage that? And um, that's why I'm not a politician, but I'm certainly here to try and to try and cover all the options for everyone. Um, so Alistair says, so just to be clear, are you saying that the output temperature of a typical air source heat pump is 50 to 53 degrees? For hot water, Alistair, yes, that would be the temperature we will look to hold the domestic hot water at. For heating, I would suggest that the average buffer tank temperature for the majority of our installations, and bear in mind, we've looked at some very old leaky properties, again, because of how they're designed and because of how the system is carefully put together in terms of how it's installed and, 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 um, and the, the figures are come up with, um, the average heating buffer tank temperature for our systems is around 45 degrees. So that's why it's important to separate hot water and heating. What we don't want to do is have the heat pump having to run at high temperature because we have set the system to run at a high fixed temperature year round. Yes, we need a high temperature of hot water, but hot water really is only going to equate 
to about 10% of your annual energy needs. And therefore, we want to ensure that the 90% of your needs, so the heating needs, are running at the lowest possible flow temperatures while still keeping your house to a temperature that is comfortable and adequate for your needs. Um, and that all come, plays its, what, the, 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 what plays its part there is obviously the size of the heat pump, if you have insulation, how we can improve that, uh, and obviously the size of the, the distribution system and how we're getting the heat into the building. Um, Tony says, are air to air heat pumps worthwhile? Certainly, I think they, should be, they shouldn't be discounted, but you have to bear in mind, Tony, that they're unlikely to qualify for any incentive schemes that are currently available, um, and efficiency may well not be as high as a comparable air to water heat pump. They will cost less to install, though. Alistair says, with solar PV and batteries, could you run an air source system off grid, i.e. with no domains electricity? Um, Alistair, I, I, I will um, encourage you to, 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 to tune in next week to my colleagues' presentation on solar PV and batteries. Um, certainly, as the battery technology improves, the likelihood of that becoming um, possible is um, getting closer and closer. But from all of my understanding at the moment, um, there isn't an option to run one completely off grid yet, unless you go to a huge investment, I would suggest. Um, so for you know, the vast majority of us, um, just having a solar PV and a battery and running a heat, air source heat pump alongside that is going to be a really uh, much more cost effective, but actually just a really effective solution. If you wanted to go the whole hog, I'm sure we could come up with some sort of design, uh, but it will probably require quite a chunky investment, which may not be justifiable. Tony says, can heat pumps be used for uh, cooling? Yes, they can be, both ground source, water source, and air source systems. Um, so if there is a need for cooling, the plant room and the heat pump can be designed specifically to, to provide that need as well as spatial heating in the, in the height of, in the height of um, winter, the depths of winter. So again, the type of cooling you might need needs to be carefully determined. Do you need cooling and heating at the same time? Do you need just cooling in one room, for example, a large living area or kitchen area, which has high solar gains? Um, and if, if that's an answer to the question, then yes, cooling could be uh, applied with a heat pump, but there may be more effective ways of, do, of providing immediate cooling in that immediate space. Um, but the short answer to your question is yes. Elliot says, any examples of covers for SOS heat pumps that satisfy listed building requirements that you could share? Um, so we tend not to put huge amounts of, uh, if, it depends what you're asking there, Elliot, whether we're talking about acoustic covers or where we're talking about just the cover of a heat pump, because certain manufacturers come up with pretty snazzy designs, such as camouflage and things like that, that can go on um, the front of heat pumps to, and to, to, to blend them into a building. And obviously an air source heat pump, really it could be painted if you wanted to, just keep the, um, make sure you don't paint over the, um, the item, the, the, the manufacturer detail, which is on the bottom left or right-hand corner of the unit, because that will be quite important for warranties and quite important for registrations and things like that but they could be painted over in terms of aesthetics. In terms of acoustic covers, acoustic covers isn't something we actively promote because we are concerned or, and our testing has shown that they have too much of a detrimental effect on performance, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't assist you if you wanted to look at that option. Alistair, can I just say that, well, oh, <laughs> thanks Alistair. Uh, Alison, do you advise some security protection for a heat pump? without affecting for efficiency for a building in a public space, e.g. a church. Yes, Alice, I would do. Um, uh, so kids, kids, uh, and I, we're all, we were all one once, um, will always potentially want to poke a stick into the fan as it's turning. Um, so if you do know you're putting it into a, a, a hidden a, a space, um, which is going to be accessed potentially by you know, the general public, then I would suggest putting a, a steel frame around that would be useful. Um, if it's a church, for example, and obviously churches traditionally can look look very nice and very pretty and people perhaps walk within their grounds um, in, in graveyards and things like that you might want to move the unit away from the building and then connect it back with a trench and, and therefore you could put it I don't know in a, the back of um, the car parking area or something like that put a cover around it make sure that no one can get to it in terms of um, putting a stick through the fans or, or messing around with the, the heat pump or you know or the pipework or anything um, whilst also ensuring that you're not preventing the heat pump from doing its job. So uh, a steel grate um, adequately sized and um, with enough separation between the two and obviously with enough access will be absolutely fine for that. And it won't be aesthetically that nice. So find a, a spot which isn't going to be so sensitive. Um, 
and then Roli, I hope I've said your name right there, is what is the annual maintenance requirement to comply with guarantees and costs? So good question. So to qualify and to continue to receive the RHI payments, you should really be maintaining your system annually with an annual maintenance contract from a, an accredited supplier. Um, we do provide maintenance contracts. They tend to differ. So, um, and we are making changes to our, um, um, our um, uh, support that we provide in terms of our um, uh, servicing. So at the moment, we just provide a, a, a one package, which is about £300 a year, which is obviously very quite expensive in comparison to a fossil fuel system. Uh, but that does require, you know, that's an annual service visit. There's access to 24-7 out-of-hours support. There's reduced costs on maybe parts out of warranty and, and, and call-out fees and, and the like. So um, that, may, that, that cost does have a lot of value associated with that. But as we roll these systems out more and more into the mainstream market, we as a company are reviewing how we service them. So we can just simply revert to doing an annual service visit, um, just as you would do with a boiler. And the cost of that will probably be between 150 to 200 pounds, I imagine. Again, slightly higher than a traditional fossil fuel boiler, but I would suggest it's small price to pay for the running cost reduction, the carbon reduction, and also the fact you're going to receive an RHI payment up to 1500 pounds a year from the government. Amar says, is there a way to automatically switch on heat pump on a time of use tariff? Uh, good question again. Yes, there is potentially, and that is likely to become more and more um, uh, mainstream. I, I'm, I'm conscious that I may have had com uh, conversations with suppliers in, in, in confidence, so I don't want to reveal too much detail, but certainly there are potential for tariffs out there uh, and technology that might allow you to take advantage of tariffs when they're running at the uh, you know when the, the tariff is, uh, is lowest um, and there is potentially an argument out there that rather than running the system on a weather compensated system setting which we've already discussed is the, the most efficient way of running a heat pump you could potentially run the system on a fixed temperature charging buffer and hot water the heating buffer in a hot water tank at a fixed temperature but using a technology which allows you to take advantage of lower tariff rates. So without um, I, the, that, that's a, more to do with the, the supplier of the electricity and the meters that they might fit and the technology they might be able to provide you. But certainly that is likely to become something which is going to happen in the future and uh, as, as this technology is rolled out more and more. Um, so that covers those questions. I'll just check... Uh, to make sure there's uh, a chat function here. Um, so just final questions. So Elliot says, could you add a little more on incoming le legislation, please? Um, I can certainly take a stab at it, Elliot. I think the, the best way to describe it though is incoming legislation is likely to be um, announced this year as the RHI scheme ends. I th my, from my understanding, there's a date of September knocking around, but I may be wrong there. Um, what we're thinking, uh, essentially what we understand is that they want to move people, particularly oil and LPG um, households, off fossil fuels. And so to do that, um, they need to then move people onto heat pumps. So it's likely that if you're developing a property or if you're going to change from, you know, you're having to change from an oil system to, uh, you want to put another oil boiler in, you're have to, going to have to come up with some pretty good, um, you know, pretty good uh, reasons as to why you should do that and not install a heat pump system. Um, it may well be a case as well in terms of carbon taxes, it might well be a case of um, building regs, it might well be a case of um, SAP 10 that, 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 that has been discussed, uh, that's, that's being implemented. Um, it might well also be a case of EPCs, for example, within rental buildings. So how are, how are air source heat pumps linked to an EPC? As, as you might have, if you own a property that you rent out to a tenant, or if you have a, um, a building which you're, you're using, um, uh, someone else is renting from you, then um, you are probably already aware that you have to have an EPC which has a D rating or above. What part, what role will an air source heat pump play within that? If it's a case there where you have a boiler and your current rating is G, but installing an air source heat pump lifts you to a D and therefore ensures that you can rent your building long term in the future, then obviously you're going to install an air source heat pump. So little changes like this will play its part in driving the country towards those that 600,000 heat pumps that, that Boris has, has come out and said he wants us to, to, to install. Um, so Martin said, as an issue I found with the Nevi 204, 240 range, 
performance, the performance at minus three is really good, but around the plus two to minus one range, the performance was much worse. And whilst the MCS temp is used at around minus three, in the south of English, the average is likely to be plus two to minus one when the Nibi can then underperform. Yes, Martin, good question again. And um, um, your knowledge is, is, is good. <laughs> it's impressive. So you're right. That, that is why, and I will suggest that we, we do this, not every installer will do this, but we size our NIBI units based upon that outdoor temperature range of plus two to minus one. So we, we want to take into account the worst case example of the NIBI unit. So if the NIBI unit drops in output at plus two, say a 12 kilowatt unit at plus two gives you 8.5 unit kilowatts, but at, at minus two, it gives you 10.5 kilowatts, then we want to base our sizing on that 8.5 figure. And that's how we work our way around that issue. Again, whilst taking advantage of what is a very good bit of kit. And then Paul says, um, and this is the last question I can say, I undertook the heat and center survey. And one aspect was that I had to have cavity wall insulation. This cannot be done in all buildings or for me. I'm still reluctant to bridge the cavity. Is there any advice you can give? Paul, you can get uh, an exemption notice from a um, chartered surveyor or even from um, I believe that we can produce some form of exemption notice or we can assist you in terms of the advice we can give you and don't quote me on that final bit but certainly you will need an exemption notice um, so therefore you can heat any type of building whether they've got solid stone walls or uh, cavity filled walls with an air source heat pump and still qualify for the incentive scheme so get an exemption notice the, the main criteria for qualification to the RHI is 250 mil of loft insulation if you can fit it, if it's physically possible, and um, cavity wall insulation if you have a cavity. And if you have a cavity and you can't put cavity wall insulation or you don't because of risk of damp or whatever, then at that point you just get an exemption notice. Fairly low cost to get, or, or if any, um, and easy to, at uh, to, to attain, um, but vital to ensure you qualify for the RHI scheme, which is obviously... 50, up to £1,500 a year, tax-free for the next seven years. So about £10,500. So it, it's certainly worth trying to take advantage of and it's available till March next year. Um, so I hope that helps everyone. Oh, sorry. Um, I hope that helps everyone. If you have any questions or queries, do uh, please contact our offices and you'll see um, all our contact details were there a minute ago. Um, but I thank you for thank you for your time today. And next week we'll be covering batteries and solar PV technology. That will be my colleague. Um, if there are any questions or queries, more, all our contact details are on our website. And have a lovely weekend. Thank you.